coming up on Self Hosted 13. Alan Pope from Canonical joins us, and Alex crashes a drone into a tree. I'm Chris. And I'm Alex, and this is Self Hosted Episode 13. Welcome back to Self Hosted, everyone. We start today with a special guest, Mr. Alan Pope. Hey, Popey. Hey, how you doing, guys? Great. I appreciate you coming on. And uh, honestly, I think our topic today, I think uh, you're going to make me put my words in my, in my, uh, in, what is it, when you, when you have to eat what you said? Because uh, today, Popey's going to join us and convince us why IRC is not dead. When I went on air and said IRC is totally dead. <laughs> but I, I was actually just being a little clickbaity. So I appreciate you being here. You triggered me, Chris. You triggered me. <laughs> Alex, uh, before we started the show, you and I were talking drones, and I discovered this week that you managed to crash a drone into a tree. And a car park, and a building, and <laughs> so to be clear, it's not one of the DJI balloon simulator drones. It's a racing drone made of carbon fiber that does 70 miles an hour. And uh, yeah, this thing ended up in a tree. And there's a video in the show notes uh, one of my buddies made where we have to fly another drone with a rope tied to it over the tree I'd crashed into to actually shake the damn thing out of it. So, yeah, that was a lot of fun. That was my Sunday. So you threw another drone at that drone? We tied a piece of string or a rope to the bottom of another drone that I have, flew it over the tree that it was stuck in, did a sort of loop-de-loop to try and tie it in some kind of like a maypole-style situation around the tree, (laughs) and then used the quad that had just flown over with the rope as like an anchor, like a barb fishing hook or whatever, (laughs) shook the tree. (laughs) And it it all came down and I didn't lose any drones. The only thing that happened was I snapped an arm off the drone, which sounds like a big deal, except for the fact the frames that I use have a lifetime warranty. So I just email them a picture and they send me a new one for five bucks every time I should have to cover shipping. Do you send them a picture of the drone in the tree or just the drone that's broken? You have to send them a picture of the carnage. I posted it on Twitter uh, about how I cracked the arm of this thing, but you can maybe see how I can bend this thing. <laughs> that doesn't look like it should do that. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's pretty bad. We will put a video to this in, a, in the show notes. If, if this is, Were you trying to use toilet paper at first to recover this thing? It looks like toilet paper, but it's actually a piece of AT&T, um, I don't know, rope that they use. Yeah. Okay. Like fishing string through cable. Like it can hold like 2,000 pounds or something crazy. So you were being a fancy flyboy and you were flying too close to the trees. What happened? Uh, yeah, or I just ran out of talent and... <laughs> well, I have no excuse because I flew my drone into the side of a barn the other day. So. <laughs> <laughs> Can I say the tree leapt out at me? I think barns are inanimate, aren't they? Yeah, yeah, totally, totally. Well, now, uh, before we uh, prove why I was wrong about IRC, um, you have been writing recently, and I have been sneaking into your computer at night, checking your documents and following along. I, I don't know if that's I should be creeped out about this, or I think I'm creeped out. Well, you did give me pseudo access after all. Oh, yeah. Yeah, maybe I should revoke that. <laughs> <laughs> but Docker Compose Workflows has been on your mind. And so I, it's funny that this came up in the show, because this week I've been told by a couple of individuals that Docker is dead, and I asked them if they've met my friend Docker Compose, because I think it sort of breathed new life into people using Docker online. Every every project you see now, somebody drops some Docker Compose example along with it. Why do they think Docker is dead, though? That's, that's what I want to know. I am the worst person to ask about Docker because I never use it for anything. Well, that's the way. Hold on. That's a good perspective. I think there's one service that I installed, two services that I installed via Docker, and that's only because that's the upstream supported way of doing it, and I couldn't find a better way uh, and that's Mastodon and Discourse. And they were both upstream supported ways. So that's what I used. I don't feel part of a Docker ecosystem or I don't feel like a power user or anything. I just pasted a command in a terminal and the service started. And I was like, okay, I'm done. But that's how it goes the first few times, right? With anything, not just Docker. And that's really what it's supposed to be like, you know, for, for if you're consuming uh, some software and you want to start a service. You just want to run a command. You want to run whatever the right command is to get the thing working and then walk away and leave it and then come back to it three months later and think, how did I set this thing up? I've got to do some software updates on this and I don't know. I had to relearn like how to do it all and 
that that was a learning curve. But yeah, once you once you get over that, it's fine. Yeah, that's a very fair uh, assessment of it. That's really true. I just recently went back to a system I set up a couple of months ago and went, oh, oh, right. Okay. Yes. Okay. I have this ad URL. I go to admin it. I have this URL where I go to use it. Uh, okay. Yeah, right. I can, re I can remember all of this. And maybe that's part of what appeals to me about some of these newer install techniques. Like, like using Docker Composes, I can go read a compose file and it's all in YAML and I can have a pretty good understanding of what it's doing. But Alex, to answer your question... I think it's a combination of answers. Fundamentally, Docker isn't doing anything that other technologies can't do because it's relying on underpinning technologies that are built into the operating system. So a lot of different vendors have different takes on how to solve this problem. And a lot of times they are better integrated into their overall product than Docker itself is. And when you combine the technical aspects of what a container actually is and how any Linux host operating system or many other OSs now can run them, and the fact that many distributions have a preferred container technology that tends to work better on their distribution and ecosystem, I, I, think, I think it's understandable that people kind of see Docker as sort of being pointless, not necessary. And then you have the VM crowd as well, who is maybe not even totally bought off on the idea of running applications in containers when they could just run it in a VM system. I was about to argue with you that various different people didn't have their own versions of container runtimes. And then I realized that Red Hat have their own, Docker have their own, VMware have bought Pivotal, so they're going to have their own. So yeah, you're totally right. Mm -hmm. I, can, I can see why people might come to that conclusion. And if I was on the Red Hat platform, I might use Podman. If I'm, and I could be wrong, but if I'm on Ubuntu, I'd probably use LXD. Yep, I use LXD for everything. Right, and there's even nice... Um, scripts or applications built around those tools to make setting up environments super quick and fast and kind of a no-brainer when you're on those platforms. So my thrust for bringing this up really was that one of the first questions I see and hear from people getting into containers for the first time is, is there a UI? Is there a GUI? Is there a web app that I can run that exposes this stuff to me? And my general answer is you don't need one. Uh, what do you think? Do do noobs need a UI? What are noobs doing running containers? They're running Unraid boxes or FreeNAS boxes or... Which have web UIs, don't they? Or Raspberry Pis. Running what, though? You don't... Nobody nobody goes out to install a Raspberry Pi. You go out because there's an appliance that you want to put on a Raspberry Pi or there's some device you want to build around a Raspberry Pi. Or you just think, hmm, that's twenty five dollars. I'm going to buy one, <laughs> and then what should I do with it when it arrives? <laughs> and put it in a drawer <laughs> with all the others. Yeah, <laughs> I have got a couple of uh, Raspberry Pis here in service. One is my uh, DNS, so it does Pi Hole and blocks adverts and stuff. That has a web UI. I almost never use it because I just don't care. It just works. Like if I have to whitelist something, then yeah, I could. I'm you know I consider myself expert. So I could use the command line, but the web UI is nicer. And for other things that I run on a Pi, they have web UIs as well. So I don't know. I think it's just a nicer experience. I, I, I could see the the argument for being hardcore and doing it on the command line because it's, you know, leak. You have total control and power. But I also quite like a pretty graph now and then. I don't necessarily disagree in a couple of ways. And uh, I recently got a note from a listener who said, Chris, you're always advocating people just use the command line. And I have kind of in the last year and a half sort of transitioned to just learn the command line because it's sort of a universal tool that will always work. But um, working with team members that learn in different ways than I learn here on our podcast team, I realized that for some of them, they want to see what the end result is that they could achieve if they invest the time to learn the whole stack. So if they can do something that gets them deploying software and turning on things and actually using the end product that gets them excited and motivated, it's it's worth it. So they'll use a GUI to, to sort of skip learning how to get on the command line, learning how to run Docker, and end up running the application, and they'll go right to using the application. They go from zero to using the application. They go, okay, this is great, this is worth it, and then they kind of walk it back. So in that way, I, I kind of think, yes, it is important to have a GUI tool because different people learn differently, and some people are extremely visual learners. 
But I want to just sort of caveat all of that with, I just want to remind us that sometimes some groups do actually put some form of design into their tools. Um, I, I remember, I think I might even have been having a conversation with you, Popey, about uh, uh, having folks at Canonical look at the syntax of the snap commands or uh, the Docker folks, they look at the syntax of the Docker commands to actually see if it logically makes sense. There is some design that goes into command line tools to make them more usable. So some tools are more usable than others on the command line. I think for me, it's not necessarily about being a hardcore elite super hacker. It's about having some way to repeatably rebuild my system when it goes tits up. I love committing text files to Git and just being able to copy paste whatever that Docker run command. I mean, this is how I started. I, I used to run one Docker run command after another and just keep that in a GitHub repo in a text file. I used Fig when that was new and Docker Compose was new. And as as it's gone on, Docker Compose has matured. And now I manage something like 30, 35 containers on a single host with one interface to it. And for me, I have a, a single text file now. It's a YAML file, admittedly, not a text file. Uh, I have a single file which defines what every single container on my system looks like. And if I want to add a new container, I have to add maybe eight lines of code because I figured out what the syntax of that YAML is. Now, that's investment I've made to learn that. And I will fully admit that for a completely new user, that's not realistic. However, I think simply asking, is there a UI like Portainer or something like that, you know, using that as your crutch rather than actually investing in learning how the underlying stuff works over time will bite you in the bum because it's just that question of when you want to redeploy something how do you do it i mean taking a few steps to address that i've started writing a wiki at home as we discussed last episode keeping notes as chris is doing now you know all these things but nothing beats the source of truth which is the file that you use to deploy the application itself and for me compose.yaml is the one i think you're two steps ahead of me um, I've just started a wiki at home to keep track of some of these things because I've now been bitten in the butt where I, like I said, didn't remember how I set up the Mastodon instance. And now I have to revisit the thing because I've got to clean it up or upgrade it or something. And I think we're in a similar state along that course. But I think what a lot of people are doing is they want to get to the goal, as Chris says, they just want to have that appliance working. They want to have that thing installed and they want the fast track to get it in. And what they don't have is the blessing of experience that you've had of things going tits up over and again and you learning from that experience and deciding to write stuff down so that the next time it does, or hopefully it doesn't, you've got a document that you can refer to to get your system back in order. And, you know, my pie hole has never broken, but it is a Raspberry Pi sat in a warm room and it's using an SD card for its storage. So inevitably, it's going to fail at some point, right? And I couldn't tell you off the top of my head how I installed that thing. I probably just did curl pipe to bash or something like that. I think appliances are a different use case altogether, though. I'm I'm more talking about those people on FreeNAS, on Unraid, or maybe people like Open Media Vault users, or, or people like me that just run Debian with some stuff actually ubuntu these days that'll make you happy as my server os and uh, i just run a bunch of containers on top of that the other thing to think about of course is discoverability you know app stores have shown us that people like to browse through a list of stuff and click on buttons and install things to try them out there are some good resources that i use to kind of counteract the gui discoverability versus the command line stuff one of those is the awesome self-hosted list, which we'll link to in the show notes. And the other is a list of containers published by the linuxserver.io team. Uh, that's at fleet.linuxserver.io. And you can actually just look through the list and it will take you through to the project page and show you how to deploy each one and all that kind of stuff. And, and even when I was actively involved in that project, which I'm not anymore, I, uh, I used to find containers on there all the time. I didn't even know they would have been working on. So... There are ways to find this stuff, even if you don't have a UI. I think that's a good point, is now 
the Linux ecosystem has matured to the point where we have these different app stores and uh, places people can go and browse a list of applications, whether they're containerized or not, is light years ahead of where we were going and finding all the individual components and compiling them from scratch like animals. Now it it is a point and click user interface and you can stand up a service or a bunch of services really super easily these days. Too easily, maybe, sometimes. Well, yes. I'm a danger to myself. I mean, what I mean by that is that if it's if the barrier to entry is so low that you set something up and you have no idea how you did it, in six months' time, maybe you set Nextcloud up using a snap or a container or whatever it is and you go where's my actual data live and you don't really understand how you did it and you wipe the wrong drive and oops it's easy done yeah and the the bigger worry is if other people depend on that service like if you set up a public service like a mastodon instance and other people are using it and you haven't kept up with your security updates or you haven't you know set it up using the best practices then people might come knocking on your door because their data is compromised or, you know, their features are not available anymore. And of course, it's going to happen on a weekend. When you're away from a keyboard and your only interface to your your Docker containers is SSH on your mobile phone. This is why you need an IRC room filled with community members. And of course, everyone knows that IRC is exploding with popularity in 2020. (laughs) Oh, Chris. So I made the bodacious claim, although it was a little um, out there, that IRC was dead. And that actually came from a FOSDEM talk where a a member at FOSDEM said, I'm not joining your open source community because it's on IRC. I'm of the GitHub generation, and I want to use Discord. I want to use Twitter. I want to use Discourse, but I don't want to use IRC. Oh, my friends, we all chat on Slack. We We don't chat on IRC. And he threw up some numbers like 13 million Slack users versus 400,000 IRC users. But there is a tinge of sadness when I talk about this because obviously you can self-host IRC and you can run other things in IRC as well. How many of those Slack users actually want to be there versus the IRC users though? Yeah, fair enough. I'd say a decent percentage are there simply because their employer mandates it. Yeah, I mean, there are some definite communities that use Slack, but you're probably right. Same with Teams. It was a big number for Teams. Yeah, I've been in slacks where it was the network effect. There was one individual who pushed everyone towards a slack. And the second they left the company, everyone left that slack completely. So nobody is in that slack anymore as a result of it being actually not what anyone wanted to use. And I realize, I appreciate that there are uh, younglings who are using new modern tools, like you say, like Slack and Twitter and Discourse. And that's fine. But it turns out there are still existing communities that have been around for a long time who do still have a presence on IRC. And it's actually not that painful to use IRC. Yeah, okay, if you're advocating for the use of RC or BitChex or one of the you know more quirky IRC clients, then for a new user, it's a bit frosty. But There are plenty of other ways to access um, IRC that are not quite as comparable with Slack, but nowhere near as frosty as it used to be. IRC Cloud is a great example of a very modern IRC client that I like to use. It does a lot of the things that Slack does, like image previews, URL previews, avatars, um, all just based on IRC. And the thing that pains me the most, and obviously our live stream for Jupiter Broadcasting is still IRC, the community is going right now, it's just over my shoulder, um, is it's all text. At the end of the day, it's all beautiful, wonderful, gorgeous text. And I, I, I would think that would be extremely appealing to the community at large. I think there's certainly uh, a compelling argument for getting down to raw ASCII. There are times when I sometimes want to paste an animated GIF or, you know, something richer in an IRC channel. But really, you've got to think about all the other people in the room. Like, what is the purpose of this channel? Why does it exist? It exists to discuss the development of a piece of software. And 
you've got a whole bunch of people from different uh, cultures, perhaps different, you know, um, connectivity. And if you're respectful of those and just use text, then it's accessible to everyone. Absolutely. And you could layer on client richness on top of that. So if you're someone that wants to see that animated GIF get a preview, then you could elect to use a client that shows that. Right. I mean, if I'm using IRC Cloud, which I have done for a couple of years now, it feels very much like the more modern, richer uh, clients. Actually, I think Slack have not really done an awful lot in, in the last couple of years. And that's given an opportunity for some of the other clients to catch up, whether it is the newer IRC clients or things like Mattermost uh, and Discourse and Rocket Chat, a lot of them are catching up with the richness that Slack has. So they're getting to be mostly on a part. And yeah, I will concede IRC is a bit behind all of the others, but there are still, like I say, a bunch of projects that are still on IRC. And so sometimes if you're working in the open source world, as we do, it's useful to maintain a presence on IRC so you can talk to these people. It does one thing and it does one thing really, really well. And uh, there is the saying that there'll be a few things left after a nuclear holocaust, cockroaches and IRC. And maybe ham radio. <laughs> I mean, I look at IRC, it's it's a it's almost like it's the communications protocol and then the client can add the, the richness. I, I know I've just said that, but I mean, think about it. Uh, one of the traditional complaints about IRC is that, well, I'm on mobile and I have varying connectivity, so it's hard for me to follow a conversation. Slack handles that really well. Well, no. An IRC client that has a server log that is keeping track of the conversation and logging it to a SQL database and then disseminates it to a client when it reconnects works perfectly well. Quasal can do that. You can host it yourself. It's doable today. I've used Quasal for many years, and uh, the, the app that makes it the best IRC experience, in my opinion, is Quasal Droid. Red Hat use it for most of their internal communications. So I'm on eight, 10 hours a day and I get all the notifications through to my phone and it just works. It's just great. I went for an alternative approach and I used to use IRSI or IRSSI if you want to spell it out. And I used to run that on my VPS and I would miss notifications when smart, I've, I've been using it since before smartphones were a thing. And when smartphones became a thing, I quite like the idea of having that connectivity to IRC on the phone. And I didn't get the notifications. Uh, and there's an app in the Android app store called IRC Notifier. And you load a plugin into IRC and then authenticate it with your, with your Android device. And from that point onwards, you get push notifications through to your phone when people mention your name or highlight you in some way or uh, PM you on IRC. So I, I started to get that availability of you know, the, the messages people were sending me and the conversations people were having. I didn't feel left out of the conversations. But the problem was I couldn't then reply because they were just notifications and so i did find myself leveraging that ssh client on my phone and i would ssh into the vps and use rc inside a screen session so that i could bash out a quick reply to someone if it was urgent and then disconnect from ssh uh when i'm done okay when you say all that i know why people are switching to discord <laughs> right that's, and that's quite brutal i mean that is between 10 and 15 years ago, I was doing that. You know, I remember being on holiday 15 years ago with my daughter in a pram and getting a push notification on IRC that something was going on. And while I'm pushing my daughter along with one hand, I'm typing in my SSH password on my phone with the other and getting into IRC. But it, it's possible. But things have moved on a bit now, and we now have better ways of being on, on IRC. The juxtaposition of you, Popey. On one hand... You're advocating for UIs to make things simpler. And on the other hand, we're talking about SSH passwords on IRC from our phone. Yeah, I'm not complaining. I, I I love the fact that I could SSH to my VPS from, you know, walking along, having a stroll around, around the Isle of Wight with my daughter. That was great. <laughs> so what do you use for IRC on iOS, Chris? Because that was one of the major pain points I had. I tried out iOS in the fall last year in autumn. And uh, I just couldn't get away with any clients that really were as good as Quasal Droid. 
Qualsal Droid does look really good. So I, I, I don't know if this is as good, but I just use the IRC Cloud client for iOS, which is just a native IRC app. I think I might have some unique requirements in that the Red Hat IRC stuff, I have to be on a VPN to connect to it. So IRC Cloud wouldn't really work for that use case. That's sort of the tricky thing is you can both roll your own solution and you have to roll your own solution with IRC in that regard. So I'm not going to sit here and try to say it's as easy as all of the other alternatives. It might even honestly be easier to set up a Mattermost server than an IRC server these days. But there's other aspects of IRC that uh, I I don't know what we would do if, say, we switched to Discord. I guess we would rewrite JBot? I, I guess? I don't know. Like, the... The bot aspect is a very nice thing about IRC, and it feels like it's a Wild West. You can do whatever you want, whereas with these other platforms, you have to get an integration. And I think that's one of the reasons why Slack took off so well with open source developers is you could press a couple of buttons and you'd have an integration that told you whether your Jenkins was operating correctly and whether your code was landing and if someone had reviewed your code. And so for developers, Slack with a few integrations was a very compelling argument against, oh, well, IRC and I have to write some Python to make my own bot or go and find a bot that someone's made and create a new IRC account and all that nonsense. I could totally see why why that's more compelling. So the whole reason we're really talking about IRC and the reason that Popey's on the show today is he reached out to me a few days ago about uh, something he's just put into a, a snap. Is that right? Yeah, it's actually been a snap for a while, but we've improved it. It's an IRC client, shall we say, but it's a web front end. So you can effectively think of it as self-hosted IRC cloud. So you install it. It's called The Lounge, uh, and it's a fork of a previous project that was called Shout IRC. Uh, You install The Lounge on your own machine, You create an account for every user who's going to use it. So multiple users can use that uh, IRC client. And then you just point your web browser at it and log in. Once you've logged in, you can then sign into all your different IRC networks. And the connection is then maintained from that, the lounge server to all of those IRC networks. And so you don't have to run any client anywhere because the lounge is the client. And all you need to do is point a web browser at it and you're an IRC. And you can point a web browser at it from anywhere, like from your desktop or from your phone. So I have a Chrome window on my my desktop, but it could just as easily be Firefox or any other browser. And that window points to my lounge server which is connected to all my IRC. But then I also have a similar browser window on my phone, which points to exactly the same URL and connects to all the same IRC channels. So I can be on exactly the same IRC channels on my phone in a browser with the rich content that you see with you know images showing up and stuff like that, that you would see in something like IRC Cloud or you know other modern chat systems. It's made a real change to me because I'm now self-hosting my own IRC client again instead of relying on IRC cloud. But also I can access it from anywhere on on the phone um, and the desktop. That's great. I like that a lot. And it's something that uh, the Linux server team containerized quite some time ago. So you can get it in a container as well if that's more up your street. It looks like the UI is really sharp too. It, it probably is, I would even say, competitive with IRC cloud. Do, would you agree having used it? Yeah, I I went through a process last week of uh, disconnecting from all my IRC networks in IRC cloud and closing it, and now I only use the lounge. The thing that I love about it is because it's self-hosted, I feel a lot more safe. It's logging everything on my own server. And a change that we made last week to the Snap, because we've got it published in the Snap store, uh, we integrated CertBot into the snap. So now once you've installed the lounge, you can then put an SSL cert on it with one line and then it puts a cron job on your system automatically and it will just keep refreshing that SSL cert. So I've now got SSL between me and my lounge server, whether I'm on my phone or I'm on the desktop. And then from my lounge server to my IRC networks, I've got an SSL connection there as well. So I feel feel a lot happier. I always had this nagging thing in the back of my head that I was, there's nothing wrong with IRC cloud. It's great. But 
all my IRC logs are hosted on IRC cloud. And there was that little twinge in the back that I just thought, I, I don't like this. You're kind of losing one of the best things about IRC by doing it on IRC cloud. I and mean, I do it out of convenience, but I, I think this weekend I'm going to make the switch to this. This looks so, so nice. Do you happen to recall with the database back end that it's storing all of this in? The logs are free texts stored on your file system. I love that. It also uh, does push notifications because it's in a browser. I just press the button to say enable push notifications. And now on my phone, I get notifications when people mention me on IRC. I click on them and it takes me straight into the browser window. It feels like an app. You know, it's it's just a browser window, just like all the cool kids use these days. <laughs> it's so nice to see something like this that you can host yourself. Ah, I love this kind of stuff, Popey. I love it. The Lounge. We'll have a link in the show notes, of course. I don't know if I'll switch from my beloved Quasal Droid, but we'll see. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try it and spin it up at least. People who use IRC, who have used it for years, are often totally wedded to the solution they've got. Like, IRC, for me, I don't care what IRC client anyone else uses. This is God's own IRC client, and you will never make me move from it, right? But... You'll hear people just as passionate about Quassel or any of the others. The guys in France at Canonical have their favorite IRC client, and all the guys in France seem to use the same one. And all the guys in the UK all seem to use Ursi. I don't know why, whether the translations are better or different or what, I don't know. But people are super passionate about their IRC client, which is a thing you never get with Slack, because there are no really first-class alternative clients for it. It's just not a thing. You just don't have that choice. Right. Yeah, that's very true. That's a good point. So, Chris, I have a question for you. Yes, sir. Why are you in your dressing gown? Oh, outing me like this on the show. <laughs> <laughs> the furnace is broken in the studio, and uh, I'm doing a podcast when it's uh, 30 degrees outside, so I figured, uh, you know, I'd get comfortable and put my robe on. <laughs> so the furnace broke in your RV and the studio in the same week. Well, the furnace in the studio has been going out for the last couple of years, and it was just this winter that it kind of gave the ghost out, you know, just like some sort of like final thing happened and it's just fallen apart. It works, but it only it only heats the upstairs. So like 50% of the studio is livable. Good job heat rises, hey? <laughs> yeah, I know. But when I do get it fixed, I'm going to need somewhere to document the fix, Alex. Do we have perhaps a wiki? The self-hosted wiki is in full flow. Uh, we have a group now with about 15 or 16 people already since the last episode uh, who have started contributing their free time, chatting all day, every day about what, you know, different technology stacks to use. For now, we're using MK Docs, but we are trying to decide whether to use that platform or another one called Hugo, which is a static site generator that might have some more customization when it comes to theming. But we're early enough in the process that what we're really looking for right now is good, solid content. And we're not trying to reproduce stuff that's already out there on the internet. You know, we don't want to provide a list of self-hosted apps because the awesome self-hosted list already does that. What we're looking to do is actually provide, you know, code snippets, Docker Compose, for example, snippets of maybe The Lounge or Quasal, like we talked about on this episode, just to help people break down that barrier of entry of self-hosting some of this stuff. You know, I flashed some Tasmota devices the other week, so I'm in the middle of writing up a little page to go on there about Tasmota and what it is and why you might like it. But also we'll link back to the particular episodes in which we talk about certain stuff as well. So one of the things I quite often get is, oh, which episode did you talk about cameras? I don't want to go through the show notes one by one, but if I can search it in the wiki and find the episode that way. Uh, that's one of the problems we're trying to solve with this wiki. But I've been delighted with the response. I must have had 30 or 40 different emails or Telegram messages from people just in this last few days alone. So if you want to be part of it, you can go to wiki.selfhosted.show, which will take you to the GitHub Pages hosted site. We are going to host it ourselves, but for now it's on GitHub Pages. And uh, be part of it. Help us choose the tech stack, choose what content goes in there and what the different directory structures and layout and all that kind of stuff looks like. It's going to be a crowdsourced thing. So if you want to have input, now is the time. 
I'm really happy to see people that are getting involved with this. It's like really that Telegram group's almost too much at this point for me. <laughs> this has completely thrown me. I've got my own wiki on like popey.com. It's just a docu wiki that I use for keeping some notes. But I've also been using Hugo for another project. And now you've mentioned it, I'm thinking, why don't I just replace my wiki with a Hugo instance? And then I could do it all nicely in Markdown. I can just use standard Git tools to commit my changes and then automate pushing it live. Oh, it's such a good idea. Use GitHub issues and pull requests and all that kind of stuff. No, I'd just commit to Master because it's my it's my wiki. I can do what the hell I want. <laughs> what was it you called me earlier? Elite hacker? Hardcore elite yeah. hacker? Yeah, that must be you now. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> so you're loving Hugo, huh? Oh, yeah. There's a, a theme I'm using on one of my sites. Uh, I think it's called Paper. And it automatically changes light to dark throughout the day. So when I refresh the browser... If I if it's in the evening, I know it's the evening because the browser just all dims nicely. It's really, really nice. That is slick. Don't look out the window and see what the light level is. No, just look at your browser. Yeah, <laughs> who needs it? We can automate that. My blind is closed. I can't see outside. I never, never do that. <laughs> <laughs> so how will the self-hosted podcast end up self-hosting its self-hosted wiki? Stay tuned and find out. But in the meantime, wiki.selfhosted.show. If you want to get involved, I guess we kind of need to get a sense of what the interest is to kind of get an idea of what the traffic's going to be to then decide how we're going to host it. So <laughs> that's the phase we're in right now. It's looking really great, though. Um, so that's super neat. That's really cool. So, Popey, where should people go to find more of you throughout the week? Oh, gosh. Well, they can go to my wiki. I have a <laughs> contact page. <laughs> but that might be moving. Can they find your last will and testament there? <laughs> <laughs> I had a very funny email actually from a gentleman who uh was it no it was on Twitter. Honey, I need to set up a wiki. <laughs> yep, that was great. That was very funny Twitter exchange. But yes. We need to have a morbid conversation in case something ever happens to me. We need a wiki, darling. <laughs> yes. <laughs> of course, Popey, you're on User Error, which is one of my favorite podcasts. Yes, absolutely. Oh, thank you. Yes. It's lovely having a uh, an argument with Dan and Joe about all kinds of random stuff. We we enjoy hearing the audience questions and trying to answer them. So if people have questions for us, uh, just ping us in the JB Telegram with uh, hashtag Ask Error or on Twitter or anywhere. We'll probably spot it. I am delighted by how often you are voicing exactly what is in my head. Even you are all the way across the pond, all the way over there. That's worrying. It is a bit actually, <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> It's really quite something. Uh, you you really often echo my thoughts on very many topics, but you deliver them better than I would. So it really, it is one of my favorite shows as well. And of course, rumor has it the Ubuntu podcast may be coming back soon. So of course, Ubuntu podcasts. It's more than a rumor. Uh, we're recording first episode of season 13 next week as we record this. Boom. Oh, announcing season 13 on SSH 13. I like it. Right there. Yes. Very nice. Very nice. Well, thank you, Popey, for making it. Thanks for having me on. 